In 2003, I, uh, I was in Nairobi in Kenya, and uh, I was staying at a hotel called the Jacaranda Hotel. Now, some of you might know the Jacaranda Hotel. The Jacaranda Hotel is a cut below the UN, so it's where the NGO, INGOs used to go and stay. And so I was staying in this hotel. I was working for Concern at the time in Burundi. And I was sitting in the lobby, and a tall Irish gentleman approached me, and uh, he said hello. I said hello. And uh, he said, uh, are you, uh, who do you work for? I said, I work for Concern. He said who he was, and he said, uh, I'm, I'm recruiting for a new scale-up that's possibly happening in, in uh, Darfur. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And he said, so what do you do? And I explained that I was involved in the Burundi. And there, there was also humanitarian. And he said, oh, so you're a disaster tourist too. And, <laughs> and so I am what they call a disaster tourist. So my way of looking at the lessons learning and future challenges is to take you a tour of some of the disasters that I've been on since then. So going back to Burundi, where I was country director in Burundi, and there was a civil war going on, basically. It was really dirty civil war. The rebels effectively were at the top of the hill, and the military were at the bottom of the hill, and they used to exchange fire. I used to stay in the middle. <laughs> so <laughs> you get a mix. And uh, what would happen is uh, there was the story of, of cattle. So what was happening is that cattle in Burundi are are very valuable in terms of cultural, but also in terms of you know assets, financial assets. So people love cows. And Burundi is just next to Congo, which is next door. So they were really close together. And what would happen is that the rebels used to come from Congo and steal the cattle. And then the military in Burundi would go back into Congo and steal the cattle back. And, and, when, and every time they were stolen, the aid agencies in the, two, in the two countries would have a program for vaccinating animals because they knew that animals were really important. So these cows were getting vaccinated in Burundi, and then they were getting stolen back into Congo and getting vaccinated again, and so forth. So they were probably the most health-resistant cows in the world. So moving on. So then in 2005, I was sent to Darfur. And uh, Oxfam used to run the camps, two of the biggest camps in El Fasher and, and uh, Niala. And what we did was water and sanitation. And uh, in El Fasher, there is, uh, the, the camp was just on the outskirts of town. And uh, Oxfam had a huge water tank, what they call a T90, for those who like technical details. It was a T90, which means it held 90,000 litres. And so we had a well or a borehole down below, a huge pumping system, and we'd pump water up to there. And I think the camp was something like 230,000 people. So we were supplying water at Sphere Standards. I'm sure you all know that is 15 litres per day per person. And uh, this was chlorinated water. We would chlorinate it, we'd test it. We were pumping out roughly 500,000 litres of water a day. It was enough to, to basically keep a small town going. And uh, when I got down, to the, to, the, to the camp, I used to go and look around, and there was always a massive queue of, of what they call bidong, which are the 20-litre containers where people get the, the water from. And there was like 200, 300 of these containers sitting in a row. And I'm thinking, oh, there's something wrong here. If we're supplying enough water, how come there's a queue? So I went back to our PHEs, they're called public health engineers, basically. Uh, they deal with the water supply. And I'm like, so what's going on here? And they're saying, well, we don't know. We, uh, we're supplying enough water. We've done all the calculations. We don't know. So I'm like, OK. And uh, I went to the other people, and I said, what's wrong? And they said, we don't know. So I said, OK, I think you ought to all get together, the public health engineers and the rest of you, the nutritionists, everybody like camp management. Go and have a look around the camp and see what's going on. So they all got in a car and spent the day having a look around the camp. And when they came back to me, they said, OK, I think we've seen what's happening. And what's happening was that the men of the camp had realized that El Fasher was growing at quite a significant rate. And there was a huge need for mud blocks. So they were using Oxfam chlorinated water 
to make beautiful mud blocks so that they could... <laughs> so again, we had lovely blocks. You could probably eat them because they were healthy enough. But that was where the water was going. So obviously we had to look at, you know, different ways of doing stuff. Okay, let me jump forward a bit, quite a long bit actually. Uh, I'm now based in West Africa in Dakar. I'm the regional humanitarian coordinator for Oxfam. And uh, I usually get sent off to, to do scale-ups or to get involved in scale-ups. So I was uh, asked to go and be the lead for the Ebola that was happening in Liberia and Sierra Leone. And this was a completely new type of, of emergency. Uh, but Oxfam were there. And uh, I had in Liberia, I had been up to a place called Nimba County. Now, Nimba County was kind of the epicenter, one of the epicenters in Liberia where we had been responding. And on the drive back, we were just getting into, uh, into Monrovia. And we had been kind of chatting, as you do in a car on a long journey. And then suddenly the driver turned around to me and he said, you see that green house on the right, just up the hill there? And it was a kind of middle class area, you know, it wasn't a poor area. And, I'm, and I said, yes, what about it? He said, that house was isolated, nobody was allowed in it. All nine members in that house died. So that was quite shocking. When you realize that, you know, you're an aid worker or whatever they call them, and... Um, you know, it's real, it's actually happening right in front of you, and it's shocking. And sometimes you can be quite, you're not involved in it, but when somebody says like that, you suddenly realize, actually, this is quite shocking. But also some good stories came out of uh, Ebola. So one of the things that Oxfam did, we realized there was maybe a change of emphasis in how you do stuff. So what happened was that we were looking to find gaps where we, could, uh, where we could support, particularly in water and sanitation and public health promotion. So public health promotion involves utilizing the community and working with the community. And in one of the really poor areas called West Point, which is a slum basically, and a, and a very bad slum at that, they had community mobilizers who were young guys. So these were kind of like uh, 21, 22 year olds. And one of the problems was that even during Ebola, the people in these kind of places were not using the health centers. So they knew there was Ebola, but they were not using the health centers because they were scared that if they went there, they'd be stigmatized, or even worse, that they might never come out. So a lot of rumors and myths had, had come out to say that these places were not good. And what these kids did was they did very, really good peer-to-peer -peer stuff where they worked with their own age group and their own age group were able to go back to their families and persuade their families to start utilizing these clinics with saying things like, you know, if you go there and you have Ebola, you've got a much better chance of surviving than if you come back here. So it was a really effective way of doing stuff. And the, the referrals to these uh, clinics increased dramatically. So it was a really cool way of doing it. And Oxfam realized in Sierra Leone and Liberia and West Africa that working with the community and getting them to be the people that are reacting to the humanitarian crisis is really important. So let me fast forward to now. So actually to get to Helsinki, I had to get, uh, I, I came from Diffa. And Diffa is in the far east of Niger, right beside the northeast uh, part of Nigeria, where the Boko Haram crisis is happening. And um, so Diffa is, is two days driving from Niamey, which is the capital of Niger. And to get here, I had to get WFP plane, which is a little Beechcraft plane, and it takes two and a half hours. So you can imagine the distance because it's the same two and a half hours it takes to get from Paris to, to Helsinki. But I didn't do that in a WFP plane. But anyway, I came from uh, Diffa and, and then afterwards we came down here. So Diffa is the, uh, is the center of where it's happening in terms of the response to the Boko Haram crisis. So it's really interesting because the pictures behind me they're very redolent. I look at them and I could be anywhere that I've been in the last 10, 15 years. So they actually, 
They've been real. I, I decided not to have any pictures because I thought they do quite a lot of the talking for me. So when you get to, um, when you land at uh, Diffa Airport, which is, it's not really an airport, it's an airstrip. The waiting room is a tree. And when you land there, you, uh, you see automatically, you see the first thing you see is two attack helicopters sitting on the runway with a couple of drones. And you're thinking, okay. So then you get the car and you drive into Diffa. And as you're driving into Diffa, you'll see massive uh, earthworks going on to protect places. And then you'll start to see uh, heavyweight military, Niger military and joint forces military uh, around with, uh, they're sitting in the pickups with the 50 caliber machine guns on the back and they're all wearing heavily armed. And then you move into town and you start to see Fulas. Now, Fulanis are the kind of nomadic tribe, and the Fulas are just wandering around with their donkeys. You also start to see camel trains, and the camel trains are the people that are bringing things in and out of Diffa. And then you go into Diffa, you'll see, you start to see a lot of shelters, temporary shelters, just bits of plastic. Uh, and that is the start when you realize that there are refugees and IDPs around. And then you come to the market, and you, and you see in the market, you know, soldiers lazing around, having coffee, smoking cigarettes. There's also people around just getting on with their daily business. And then you, you see a lot of NGO vehicles around. And you realize that this is the kind of environment I've become used to, where it's, it's basically something of everything going on. There's military, there's rebels, there's normal life going on, and people have to cope with all of that. But let me give you another example. Outside of town, around 100 kilometers out of town, there's a place called Tumur. Tumur is a, a small, basically a, a small town, maybe 10,000 people. And uh, now, because of atrocities happening in Chad, because of military uh, pushing people out of Niger because of people running away from the Boko Haram and military in Nigeria, even as far as Cameroon. It's now got an extra 40,000 IDPs, refugees, returnees. So that means the town of 10,000 people is now become a town of 50,000 people. And these people that have come there have nothing. They've got no water, no sanitation. They're just starting to get food but also the people of the town, they're what you call the host community. They had even less than the people who've arrived. And there's a lot of talk about refugees all the time and refugees going to Europe and the emphasis on stopping refugees going to Europe. The vast, vast majority of refugees don't go to Europe. They just want, they're 30 miles displaced from their home or 100 miles and they're staying with host communities. The host communities are the ones looking after them, not people in Europe. So finally, and kind of in conclusion, I want to talk about one of the things that I least like doing because I'm not academic at all, and that is writing proposals. And sadly, you have to do it. And I'm always trying to uh, remember what is the goal, what is the objective, whether it's a process indicator or an activity indicator, but anyway, one of the things that you do in proposals is that you are basically trying to convince donors that you have the solution to the problem. So, you know, they have no water, or we're going to provide water. They have no food, we're going to provide food. But when you actually come down to think of it, I don't think we, we are the solution. In fact, I think we have to start seeing ourselves not as a solution, but more like the problem, or at least part of the problem. And if we can start doing that, then I think we can start looking at how to actually respond in terms of future challenges much more positively. So thank you very much.